Okay, so. All right, so uh, the recording has started and uh, we would like to welcome you to uh, our Teacher for Learning uh, Lunch and Learn. Um, so today, um, what we're um, we're going to do a few different activities, um, and we'll get started um, with a few introductions. Um, so uh, my name is Alyssa Bigelow, and uh, I'm an instructional design technologist, um, and I am currently uh, a program facilitator for the Ontario Extend program. Uh, and we also have uh, a facilitator who's not joining us today, but uh, her name is uh, Charlotte, and she is an instructor and a course coordinator, uh, as well as a program facilitator uh, with us. And I am Bert Slesser. I am also an instructional designer. I'm coming from Georgian College. I kind of, my, my job sort of flip-flops between instructional designing and, and faculty development. And uh, since the pandemic, I've been involved with uh, the Center for Teaching and Learning at Georgian. And I've been a number, of, part of uh, a number of different projects uh, regarding um, educational technology and, and uh, iFlex development as well. So in this presentation, uh, today we're taking you through a, a specific part of the Teacher for Learning uh, module. So we've kind of already started with this, but you know, introduce yourself in the chat, let us know who you are and where you're from. A, a quick reminder of, of muting your microphone if you're not speaking. Uh, you can use the chat or feel free to unmute if you have any questions. Um, you can use the closed captioning button to enable closed captioning on demand. Uh, so if you need the live transcripts, that's available as well. And then Alyssa is mm -hmm. going to be uh, providing specific links uh, to in the chat when we are referencing certain material. Uh, so for example, refer to the chat window for instructions on how to access the simultaneous French translation and PowerPoint presentation. Um, and as we already said, the session is being recorded. And maybe I'll just stop, you know, for, for just a minute here and see if anybody has any questions before we keep going. All right, I think we're good. So before, uh, before we get going here, I just like to uh, begin by honoring and acknowledging that the offices of eCampus Ontario are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I recognize and I'm grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the First Peoples of this land. And I invite you in this call today to advance your own personal journey toward truth and reconciliation and ask how we can move from acknowledgement to action. And part of our journey has been to learn more about the nine Indigenous institutes in Ontario, which are Indigenous governed and operated institutions that provide a culturally responsive learning environment for students and their families. Uh, so please use the links uh, that uh, Alyssa is putting into the chat to learn more about the work of these institutes across Ontario. All right. Um, so as you know, um, we are working uh, with Ontario Extend Professional Learning for Higher Education. And this session is focused on um, doing some activities within the Teacher for Learning module. Um, so I've posted the link um, to the, the website there um, where you can get more information about this, um, this module as well as, as some of the others. So uh, we can continue on. Um, one of the, uh, we'll just give you a little bit of background about the program. Um, so it was originally launched in 2017. So it's, it's been around for a little while um, and uh, it's gone through a, a few different iterations. Um, there are six modules that make up uh, a, a digital micro-credential called the Empowered Educator. 
Um, each one of the modules um, takes about four to six hours to complete. So uh, there is there is some work involved with them, um, but the uh, the activities are are really great to work through. Um, each one of the modules, um, you can earn a digital badge when you complete and submit uh, your um, activities to a specific activity bank. Um, so those digital badges, uh, you will be able to apply for those at the end of each module and you can receive them um, after that. Um, each of the modules um, and the entire program is, it can be self-directed, um, self-paced and collaborative. So um, the materials are all available uh, on the Ontario Extend website, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and this fall, um, we are bringing the Ontario Extend content into um, the Brightspace environment uh, to look at community building. So uh, we have some different opportunities that we'll speak about a little bit later. Um, all of this material is Creative Commons openly licensed and it is available in both French and English. Um, and one thing you'll notice, um, even from our chat window, uh, we have diverse participation. So we have people um, who are in instructional design roles, we have faculty, um, we have teacher for other teacher for learning staff, faculty developers. Uh, so it's it's a great mix of different um, different folks around the province. Awesome. Um, all right. So this slide, uh, I'm not going to speak to every little bit and piece on this slide. Um, but uh, the program was uh, designed around uh, Simon Bates. Um, description of the 21st century educator. Um, so as you'll see here, uh, each one of the modules um, has a, these are the representations of the digital badges you can earn. Uh, so we have the teacher for learning, we have the curator, which deals with open educational resources. Uh, there's the technologist um, that helps uh, you select appropriate technologies to so solve learner challenges. Uh, we have the collaborator module, which is all about building uh, personal learning networks and connecting with people. Uh, the experimenter module is the fun one. It's the one where you get to um, experiment with new technologies and try some new things in a, in a great place. Uh, and then we have the scholar module as well. And that one focuses on the scholarship of teaching and learning. And when you do all six of them and complete all six of them, you earn the empowered educator micro-credential. And so today we'll basically be walking you through a, a piece of the teacher for learning module. And I think for those of us that are maybe newer to micro credentials, you might, we, we'll, there'll probably be a bit of time in this webinar to maybe ask more questions or for us to expand on some of these aspects that you might be unfamiliar with. Um, Today, specifically, we're, we're looking at uh, the Teacher for Learning module. We're looking at the outcome here. It says design effective learning activities and experiences that are grounded in research-based principles of learning that promote students using their knowledge in meaningful ways. And it, it's, it's um, when I think of the Teacher for Learning module, I would say this is probably one of my favorites and that it's most down to earth. And it there are quite a few activities within this module, but um, and the Lunch and Learn will take a, a couple of those activities and look at them in, in detail. And this is probably the one that you might feel most familiar with as well. There might be things in, in this specific task or activities that we get you to do today where you think, oh, you know, I might, I might already do this in my practice. And I think a great way to, to reflect on the, the Teacher for Learning module is to, is to kind of see how you can improve what you're already doing or be cognizant of the fact that uh, of these sort of techniques and strategies that we use um, and, and maybe find a way to improve them as you go through. So the objectives in this case, uh, you know, reflect like what I just mentioned on core beliefs about teaching and learning and the ways they impact teaching practices and your learning outcomes. Um, number two there, examine, you know, your teaching approaches and strategies that foster student learning. Uh, so this is going to look at your your UDL approach and that metacognition that I was I was just sort of mentioning there, 
And then identify number three considerations when designing significant learning experiences that are grounded and informed by research-based principles. Uh, so a lot of these things, once we get into some of these activities, you'll say, oh, okay, yeah, right. I think I do this. And once you get into them, it's, it becomes, it's, it's actually really interesting. When I did it myself, I realized that, okay, I, I think I do some of these things. And I realized that there were some small gaps in my practice. Uh, and this module will help, help uh, smooth those gaps and, uh, and uh, clear, clear some of it up. So uh, the specific activities that on the right side, you'll see a list. Um, so for each badge, uh, Alyssa mentioned that it takes four to six hours to complete. So on the right hand side, you're gonna see all the tasks or activities that would take in combination would take four to six hours to complete and to work through the module content on, uh, on our website. So there's a misunderstood activity, the concept map, Cornell notes, et cetera. The ones with the check marks beside them, uh, the WIIFM is called what's in it for me. And then we will also look at the metaphor uh, activity. And if there's time in this session, then we'll also check out thought, thought vectors. Um, but in this case, we are going to kind of do a, almost like a quick ride or a, a hands-on activity in this webinar. We thought it might be good just to get a bit more uh, practicality out of it, as opposed to just listening to us talk the whole session. All right. Um, so uh, with that, um, we'll move into uh, the first activity. So. As Bert mentioned, part of this lunch and learn is to um, is to get you to dig into um, the modules and and start becoming familiar with um, some of the activities, and you know get a head start um, as to how you can go through and complete the modules. Um, so what we've done is prepared um, a short activity for you to um, think of an example of what's in it. For me, so when when you're thinking about your courses, um, when you've got students sitting there, you know what what are they going to get out of it? Um, and that's kind of really what's behind the motivation. A lot of motivation for students is, you know, how can I benefit from it? What's in it for me? Um, so what we'll get you to do, um, we'll we'll take about maybe ten minutes or so. Um, and get you to think of an example of something in one of your courses that would be a really good what's in it for me. Why would students need to know that? Um, why would it be good for them? Um, we've uh, also got uh, a Google Doc that is um, accessible here um, that you are welcome to type your answers or your submissions into the Google Doc. Um, and then the goal is to have your what's in it for me activity um, finished up so that you can submit it to the activity bank and work your way towards completing um, the teacher for learning badge. Um, so I'm just, uh, I put the link in there for the um, activity bank and just give me one second to grab the uh, Google Doc. And it's not grabbing the link. So just give me one second. And if you're somewhat, uh, you know, unfamiliar about eCampus Ontario and the Ontario Extend um, uh, website and using uh -huh. the activity bank and whatnot, that's that's okay. Um, you know, if there's questions about it later, then you can definitely ask and there's no pressure to submit anything at this point. But um, like sort of the goal or, or the aspect of this webinar is to give you a taste of, of what we sort of the programming that we usually run and part of the programming in our fall as well is to offer um, uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, sessions, um, whether it's the, you know, the two week uh, crash course or whether it's a Saturday crash course or the, or the lunch and learn. So um, if this is slightly new, then that's, and, and you're wondering what is the activity bank? That's, that's okay. We can answer mm -hmm. those questions. Yep. Um, 
So the Google Doc that I pasted in um, to the chat there, um, it, it has a few pages and there's just some prompts on the pages to get you thinking in different ways about um, your, your courses and your content. So on the, on the first page there, um, one of the prompts is to get you to think of different ways that you organize information for your students. Um, if you keep scrolling a wee bit, you'll, you'll find a prompt about, you know, what have you found most helpful for your, for your, um, so far? Um, and then finally, there is um, the sharing space about your ideas about how you can identify uh, the what's in it for me to help your learners. Um, so if you're comfortable um, contributing to this document, you know, feel free to start typing away and, and adding some things. If you're not so comfortable with that, you know, you can start your own document and, and keep your, your thoughts to yourself. That is totally fine. Um, Maybe do you want to do you want me to switch over to the doc, Alista, so we can just have a quick look at it? Yeah, if you'd like to, sure. I see there are a few people in there, so that's great. Um, I think you know, like when I think about the what's in it for me activity, um, you know, when I think of an assignment and I give an assignment to a student, uh, I already like in my mind, I think I already have a general idea of 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 why they need to do the assignment. Um, and I remember doing this activity for the first time thinking, oh yeah, I, I do this. And I went back and looked at a lot of my assignments and I, I think I would miss putting it down in, in text, you know, in, in, in the assignment itself. And I think I would talk about it with my students and say, hey, why is this important? Why do we need to know this? Or why do we need to, you know, you know, why would you need to go through a, a lab or why do you need to be um, attentive to your writing or the clarity of your ideas or uh, the type of communication that you're you're working through? Why whatever assignment or task that you're doing, well, you know, what's in it for them? What, how is it going to benefit them? And even though I might know the idea behind it, they might not. And if I think I've been clear, um, I always recommend just going back and and, and checking it to say, all oh, right, was I was I really clear on how well I conveyed this this message? Um, because when I went back, I realized, all oh, right, <laughs> there there was a lot of information I don't think I conveyed to my students about uh, what it what might be in it for them in terms of uh, academic value, uh, employ employability skills, um, uh, personal growth. Uh, working through, you know, specific challenges. So there's there's quite a bit that you can you can maybe pull. So does anybody have any questions about the activity? And feel free to unmute as well. I know it's a <laughs> webinar, and so some people might feel uncomfortable talking <laughs> and being recorded, but. Um, Sometimes it's easier to, to have a bit of a conversation. Perfect. These are great points here that people have brought up on the screen already. I assume, Alyssa, you can see my screen, correct? Mm -hmm. I'm sharing yep, the right yep. one. Yeah, good stuff. Yep. <laughs> so being prepared for your career, professionalism, absolutely more money. Um, prevent negative consequences in real world. Absolutely. You know, I spoke to a, um, some, one of the faculty that I work with is in, uh, pharmacy and they call it a, I think like a near, near miss, I think is the terminology that they might use, uh, for, for when they have a, like, a you know, if they give the wrong prescription or make a, a dosage error. And uh, so this is a great example, preventative, of, like in, in real world situations, I think some students forget that they're, you know, they're not just not only impacting their academic development or their grades or their, um, their bottom line, but that it can affect other people as they move forward. So yeah, high marks, right, concept industrial items. Yeah, absolutely. develop your professional network. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, I know that a lot of uh, students at uh, our local, like at, at Georgian College, 
they end up going out into the community and working. And so um, sometimes they forget that, you know, how, how much they put in to an activity or an assignment or work through a process uh, has an impact on, on who might hire them in the community or, or how they develop themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would anybody uh, like to jump on the microphone and, um, and speak to some of um, the things that, they, that they're thinking of? No, no takers. <laughs> totally fine. Um, yeah. So, um, so this um, activity, uh, what we'll um, have you or, or suggest that you do is keep a record of um, some of the ideas that you've been able to come up with, whether you've shared them or whether you you have not. And that's totally fine. Um, keep a record of those. And then um, the next part of the process would be to um, submit them to the activity bank, um, which is a repository of submissions um, from other educators uh, in the province. So it's, um, it's the space where um, uh, your activities go uh, to when you're applying for a badge, you will get uh, a special URL that you can use to apply for the badge. Uh, for each one of your activities. The other nice thing uh, about the activity bank is that it is an open repository. So if you're unsure about what to do for the, for the activity, um, sometimes people interpret things differently. Um, so you can actually go in and have a look at the other submissions um, that are, are in there. Um, and, uh, and you can get some ideas based on, you know, some of the things that other people have, have contributed. Um, and then when you submit yours, it goes into that repository as well. And, um, you can help, um, other learners in the future with your submission. Okay. So back to, back to our slides. And if anyone has any questions, definitely just throw them into the chat. I think we'll keep, keep moving on. So this is thinking about your teaching philosophy. It's called a metaphor activity. And it's looking at what is your metaphor for teaching and learning. And some of us are, you know, if you've ever been to teacher's college or have done your MED or uh, have just spent time thinking of it, then you might be aware of your own teaching philosophy. Uh, if not, then hey, this might be the time to, to consider it, even if it's just a few for a few minutes. Um, and in this activity, like I said, these are activities that are things that maybe we do naturally, but maybe don't give ourselves the time to actually reflect on it or be co cognizant of it. So think about what your, your um, philosophy is and see if there's a metaphor for it um, and find a photo or you can draw a picture. Uh, you can use Unsplash, which is a series of uh, closed, or sorry, not closed captioning. I was going to say closed captioning. It's not that. It's uh, uh, openly licensed uh, uh, images, so you can use them. They're free to use and explain why the image represents you and your approach as a teacher. And again, we're going to give you some, some time to, to think about it. Um, yeah, and in the chat there, um, I've posted a link to the website that Bert mentioned on splash.com. Uh, uh, it's a fantastic open image repository um, that you're welcome to look for pictures that represent your teaching philosophy. Um, and then um, I've also put the activity bank link in there uh, so that if you're, if you're wanting to do your submission, um, you can go ahead and do that. Um, so you would just attach your picture and uh, type your response about why or how this image represents you and your approach as a teacher. 
platform, Alyssa, if they have not created a, an activity bank account, they would probably have to create one, I believe, right? Before they yeah. submit. Yeah, yeah. slide my apologies so I'm wonder if I should show an example too at this point for for people I can bounce back into my the link on the slide should uh, should work there yeah there you go So this is just one, this is an example that I used um, for example, I, I said my teaching philosophy had to do with uh, like a constructivist learning a learning theory, just that the idea that when you come to any new thing, any new task or activity, you're coming in with your own experiences, your own um, prior knowledge, and you, everybody has their unique lens. So I use this picture above as, as a metaphor um, to kind of say, hey, like, you know, what do you, what do you see? And, um, you know, it's a, you know, I asked the question at the beginning and say, you know, what is it? You know, is this, is it sculptured fabric? Is it a outside of a spaceship? Is it the roof of a, health, a w wealthy person's mansion? Or is it a scrap piece of metal from a wrecking yard? Um, uh, to, to give you the idea that you might look at this image and it might mean nothing to you, or it might mean something specific to, to you that's much different than me. And that's sort of the, my constructivist philosophy in, in a nutshell as, as a metaphor. Uh, if anyone's been to the EMP in Seattle, this is an outside shot of um, the Experience Music Project, uh, which is kind of a, a great architectural um, piece uh, for, for a museum. So that's just one example of, uh, you know, the metaphor activity of what it might look like uh, with an image and a little write up. And then that's something that you can submit to the activity bank. And you might not need to write this much. You could write less or, or more, depending on how you related to the, uh, the activity. So maybe just to kind of spur on some, some reflection, maybe if people want to in the chat, if they're willing to uh, share even a, a glimpse of their teaching philosophy, if they, if they have one, and that might help other people that are online as well, just to reflect on their own practice. It doesn't have to be uh, something fancy or theoretical. It can be pretty simple. Yeah, you're welcome to um, to paste your link to your photo that you find, and and if you'd like to either comment in the chat or, um, again, you can jump on the microphone, um, or I can um, g give you screen sharing um, ability if you'd like to share your screen and explain um, your your metaphor. So we'll we'll open it up for for anybody who would like to share.
Um, so Bert, just um, just to kind of interrupt a wee bit. Um, so we've had a couple of new people um, join in the conversation into our session here. Um, and sure. just to kind of catch you up, um, we are doing one of the activities that are found in uh, the Teacher for Learning module in the Ontario Extend program. Um, so everybody is uh, searching for a photo um, uh, on one of our um, free photo sharing websites. Um, I will repost those links uh, again so that you'll be able to access them. Um, and uh, we're looking at finding an image that reflects um, what what represents you as a teacher um, and, and your approach. So we're looking at teaching philosophy. Um, so essentially uh, find an image um, that will um, represent who you are and, and how you feel about teaching. Um, and I'm just gonna grab the links again. We have shared uh, a link to uh, the unsplash.com website. Um, Unsplash is a free photo uh, sharing website that you're able to, um, to use and reuse the, the photos that are posted there. Um, there, are, there is a, a condition that you need to basically cite your source uh, when you use a photo. So um, as you'll see, with the, uh, the picture that's on uh, the screen right now that uh, shows a bunch of different metaphors, underneath that picture um, is a citation to give credit back to the original author, who in this case for this image is unknown. Uh, when, you, when you find an image on Unsplash uh, and you download that image, it will prompt you to copy the citation so that you can um, make sure to give credit back to the original author. So we're really, just giving everybody um, a little yeah, bit of time. I'm Go really ahead. tempted to, to ask um, some questions to some of our, our participants. Um, I see Heather, I don't want to pick on, I'm, I'm kind of picking on you a little bit just based on um, the department that you're working in. So I'm not sure if you're, if you're still, if you're listening and you're there, I'm just really curious to know, Heather, whether your approach as faculty of nursing um, whether your approach has, uh, assuming that you teach nursing students, um, whether your approach has changed based on the ever changing environment, shifting environment that nurses are currently working in, whether you have to approach your students any differently uh, to prepare them for uh, what they're going into with regards to, 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 to COVID and the, the challenges that um, nurses and doctors and, and a, a whole ton of health professionals uh, deal with, with burnout and whatnot? Very good question. Um, very very could... loaded, loaded question. So Indeed. I apologize for putting you on the spot, but I was just really curious to know whether your approach just had to, had to shift and, and whether you've noticed a, a change in student behavior dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. So I teach primarily in our graduate program. Um, which is offered mostly online with the exception of one sort of segment of that program. So from a delivery standpoint, not much has changed. Gotcha. However, um, because it is a graduate program, all of our students are registered nurses already. So mm -hmm. they are really struggling to balance the demands of a full-time school program while a lot of them are also working full-time or even above full-time because of the demands being placed on healthcare providers. So I think my uh, position as a teacher, I would say it sort of expanded a little bit. I find myself doing a lot more sort of support for the students, um, looking at ways in which we can start to create more of a sense of community within the program so that they've got one another to rely on, um, and also just offering different types of speakers and uh, resilience building lectures that we may not have done in the past. So uh, I think it's a great addition to the program and I hope that we keep a lot of this going forward. The, the thank, thank you for that answer. That's a great answer. And, um, you know, I think unless you work in healthcare, I think that sometimes you're, you're not attuned to everything that goes on uh, in the background. So I can, I, the resilience is, is key. I, you know, I have a, 
uh, a good friend of mine who's doing a uh, his res residency as a, a physician down in uh, Georgia right now and in the United States. So I, I hear different stories and I get different information and uh, you don't realize, you know, the challenges that, 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 that uh, our healthcare professionals are going through. So um, in terms of, you know, working with these students, are they, are they different ages? Uh, like, are they coming at it from different times of their life or are they majority you know, or a good chunk of them are just around the same age, like, or, or does it really depend? And that's just more me being curious about the, the demographic. Yeah, I think it varies a fair amount. Most of our students are sort of, have been in the workforce for a couple of years as registered nurses, but to your point about sort of family stages and life stages, um, a lot of them do have families, particularly young children. So I think that adds an extra layer of complexity in terms of being able to support them because not only are we supporting them from an academic perspective and from a resilience perspective, but also thinking about what sort of advice or support can we offer them in order to be able to manage the additional challenge of having children at home that they're homeschooling or children that they're maybe keeping back from daycare because they're not so comfortable sending their kids to daycare quite yet. So there's a lot happening in the program right now, that's for sure. Yeah, no kidding. I'd be, you know, I won't ask you to share it, but I'd be really curious to know, you know, and you might have to think about it for a while, <laughs> you know, what, what picture did you come up with, you know, that represents your, your approach or your metaphor, uh, because that is, uh, it could either be like a really simple, you know, picture, uh, or it could be something really complicated because it seems like it, there's, there's a lot going on. I haven't found a picture yet. I'm scrambling around, but sort of looking <laughs> for something that, that okay. projects an image of like, a curator or a facilitator or a connector of all of these pieces so my, my yeah. first thought for that would have been an octopus Ooh, I like <laughs> it. you're going all over the place you got your hands in like everything that that would have been my first thought i may have to borrow that That's a really good <laughs> suggestion thank you no problem oh that's great thanks tracy yeah. for yeah thank you heather answering there or sorry, I'm looking at the chat and reading Tracy's name. <laughs> oh. My apologies. Would anybody else like to share some of their experiences um, with their with their teaching? Um, Bert brought up a really great point because you know we all have gone in to, to teaching and learning um, with kind of like an initial philosophy or initial approach and. Um, as you become a more seasoned um, educator, uh, your your approaches and your thinking change and they evolve as you learn more more and more about the dynamics of your students and, and the environment. And uh, especially right now, uh, within the last year and a half with uh, with the pandemic, um, you know, that has really shifted a lot of people's um, thinking and, and ways of doing things and and you know, engagement and, and interaction um, are are key to um, keeping the students involved in in the material. So I'm just wondering if anybody else would like to share maybe how how your philosophy has shifted during this time. I'd be curious to to know, and I'm I know I'm picking on people, so I apologize, but um, I see like Tra Tracy here is li librarian from engineering, and I look at engineering and and nursing as well as being very hands on programs. Um, so Tra Tracy, if you're if you're listening still, I'd be curious to know whether you know the shift to online, like, you know, what Alyssa is talking about changing your dynamic. Did you, did you in your, I would assume that as a librarian, you're in, um, uh, you know, you chat a lot with, with other faculty and maybe how to help their students potentially. Um, I'm just really curious of whether your assessment, whether you heard, a, whether assessment styles had to change drastically or, or, to try and give something like engineering students more, uh, find a more hands-on, more real-world, uh, more authentic assessments 
and that they're trying to, you know, be building or manipulating things with their hands or, or maybe doing, uh, working with different software to, to meet their needs. I was just curious as maybe as a librarian, you know, what did that, what did that look like in terms of your support for them? Um, so I think some of the changes, so as far as assessment goes with the engineering students, a lot of um, things we've been hearing is it's just a lot of stress on students to write an exam online. Um, so a lot of people have been um, helped them with this, doing a lot of practice exams and like that don't, that aren't worth any marks, but just allowing them to explore the online environment and what an exam would be like um, before they did it. So whether or not it's a time, you know, like um, some exams you have to answer one question before you can get to the next one and you can't go back. So the students can kind of, um, whereas some you can flip back and forth. So just to kind of allow students to see what an exam would be like people are setting up in the department, um, faculty, those kind of um, exams to help them out just so they can see it um, a little soft launch. Um, and that seems to help students um, with some of their anxiety when it comes towards um, the assessment. Um, so some of the, um, I'm not sure about some of the more technical hands-on classes, they, um, they, they maybe can't run through things, but we have um, our first year students um, in the second semester, they actually have like real clients that they meet with and they help design in a team an engineering solution for them. Um, so this year um, they met with their clients online and um, the library is always a, usually a client, um, acts as a client for a couple of these groups. So we met with some of these students online and um, uh, the output and the experience of interacting with the students. I mean, some of them were a little bit more nervous on a Zoom meeting than they were if they come into your office. And I think some of them were probably less nervous, but um, you know, looking at the output that they, they were creating for these um, design solutions for clients all across the community was really amazing. So I think, um, I think that they really did quite well with that. And um, it, being online didn't seem to affect them as much. I mean, they couldn't, you know, it was, they had some computer glitches and, you know, people couldn't enter to Zoom meetings and stuff. But um, yeah, I really think that the students adapted quite well um, and were quite resilient. They're just missing community a bit, I think. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fascinating. It's funny how, as you go through this, like new things, it's like an onion and things just keep getting revealed or pulled back about, you know, how we, how we teach or how we, uh, how people are impacted by, by the shift to online, both positive and negative. So I think, you know, I, I would have thought, you know, to be honest, that engineering would have had a, a more of a struggle. It doesn't necessarily sound like that. Um, and not to assuming, I don't know why I would assume that, but uh, I think I was just thinking more of those, those practical hands-on experiences are just kind of uh, changed. And then, so the dynamic of class changes and, and how to, you know, get that information, uh, teaching to, to those students, how do you get that through? So I think that's fascinating. And, and, um, yeah, I appreciate you just responding. And I think anytime you start thinking of a, an, an image to try and go along with anything that you said, hopefully that's a good, a good challenge and you can kind of create a, a metaphor and hopefully it, it helps your practices as well as, as it did with, with ours, as we went through this. All right, anyone else? We're getting to the end here. We have uh, just just over uh, 10 minutes left in our uh, in our time. Did anyone else want to share? And I promise I won't pick on anyone else. So I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate the uh, uh, Tracy and 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 Heather for <laughs> for being willing to answer my questions. <laughs> I think everyone slips into student mode when they when they uh, go on to this. I know I do. If I ever go on a webinar, it's mic off, camera off, and, and I hide incognito. Yeah, and today's sessions too, they're, they're slightly different. Um, we're, we don't necessarily like just talking at you guys. Um, so that we've, we're trying to build in some practical elements to get you started and to help you along the way. Um, into uh, becoming an empowered educator. So we're just giving a little bit of a taste and, and hopefully um, you've been able to think of some ideas or and find um, a picture to, to complete those couple of activities. 
Um, and we'll, we'll get into, in just a couple of minutes, we'll get into some of the different opportunities that we're offering throughout the fall semester so that you can engage and interact and um, join, join the community um, for that. We probably don't have time for this one, I don't think. Alyssa, no, I, no, I was, I was thinking we don't, we don't uh, necessarily want to go right till two o'clock either, just to give everybody, you know, that time to be able to get a drink or, you know, just prepare for your next meeting, because we do respect the fact that, you know, everybody's back to back to back right now. Um, so yeah, I guess we can kind of continue on and just wrap, wrap things up here. And then, um, and then, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have upcoming sessions. And these webinars are just sort of a taste of what we do. Um, if you come to another teacher, teacher for learning lunch and learn, I would imagine it would be pr pretty similar to the one that you're getting today. Um, but tomorrow we have one that's based on the experimenter module. And on Thursday, we also have uh, another lunch and learn based uh, webinar, sorry, uh, that's based on the curator module, which is uh, heavily to do with uh, open access uh, educational resources. Um, every evening, uh, we'll have, or not every evening, but evening facilitated sessions. Uh, so we run through two week uh, at a time, we run through a module that is, uh, there's three synchronous sessions. So the MMF stands for the first Monday and then the next Monday. And then uh, the, within that same week of the second week, we wrap up on the Friday. So we go, um, it's basically a, a kickoff, a check-in and a debrief. And those are synchronously run uh, sessions and they're to complete one module. And that would get you a badge and there's six in total. Um, the idea behind that is that if you have questions around the module, how to submit things to the activity bank, like we were talking about today, um, interaction with other faculty from, from other parts of Ontario is also helpful to hear those different experiences and, and people's um, approaches to, to different activities and tasks is helpful uh, to sharpening your skills. Tuesdays, uh, Lunch and Learns, 12 to 1, that will be throughout the throughout the fall, fall semester. And Wednesday evening drop-ins, again, will be throughout the fall semester, 7 to 8 p.m. And then Saturday extenders. Uh, so these are if you want to do a sort of um, a crash course that's, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, uh, compacted is not the word I, I want to use, but condensed is the word I'm looking for. So if you're looking for a condensed version of the module uh, that you can get done in, in close to a day, uh, then you could do that and it would fast track you to completing a badge. And so those are going to be run, I believe it's every other Saturday, Alyssa, is that right? Yep, uh, it's every other Saturday following um, the two weeks for each module. So that second week um, would be uh, after the Friday, uh, we, we run a Saturday as well. Perfect. And so the nine to 12 and one to four is, is basically there's two sessions on the same day. And that just gives you the opportunity to say, hey, I just want to attend three hours in the morning or three hours in the afternoon. It's just as being as flexible and open as possible. Um, and just to kind of reiterate back to just the, the mantra of, of the extend program is that it's, it's uh, self-paced, self-directed. Uh, even though we have synchronous sessions on here that you can attend on the on the Monday, Monday, Friday, there is no sort of mandatory that you have to come. You could come to one and not the other, or you could come to the very last one if you really wanted to, uh, to see what a debrief it, uh, is like and see what people are talking about. Um, but it's, uh, it's nice and open and gives you that freedom to kind of work through content at your own pace. Anything else, Alyssa, that I missed? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, actually, none of these, none of the facilitated, um, the community meetings, um, none of those are, are registration. Um, so the, the webinars that we're hosting this week, so today, tomorrow, and Thursday, um, those are, um, uh, requested to have registration. Um, the rest of the facilitated sessions and the drop-ins and the Saturdays, um, those do not require registration. So um, you'll have to register um, for the main 
access to the module that you're interested uh, in in joining. And then you'll the join links are all available within uh, the course space. So if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to uh, feel free to, to pop your questions in the chat. Um, thank you very much. Thanks for for your participation. I know I picked on a couple of you, so I appreciate uh, you uh, you sticking it out and uh, and and unmuting. You're very brave, <laughs> and so I appreciate it a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you have questions about the program, you have any questions about you know what steps next to take if you're wanting to try and uh, complete more of these modules then feel free to connect with us um uh, or through our, through our emails or here in the chat and that uh, concludes our our session thanks heather i appreciate it thanks tracy thanks beverly yeah thank you for coming everyone